Okay, we're rolling. We're rolling. Two, two cameras rolling? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. All right. You're looking at me through the whole thing. Got it. And I'm just going to start in uh, general asking you who you are <laughs> and how you fit into Jim Cahill's world. Uh, so my name is Michael Hatch. I'm a PhD student at Princeton University. Uh, and I study the history of Chinese painting. Um, I got to know Jim because I ended up spending two summers helping him in his kind of, um, sort of stage moving back, to, stages of moving back to Berkeley uh, from Vancouver. One of his students who is now a professor at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, Pat Berger, was giving a lecture on campus uh, here at Princeton. And that was in the spring of 2010. We were all out to dinner afterward, and I mentioned that I was going to Berkeley to study a classical Chinese uh, over the summer uh, there. And that if she knew any place where I might, you know, put my hat, uh, I would appreciate it. And she said, actually, Jim Cahill is beginning to move back as well, and he'll be here, you know, in, in chunks, and then in Vancouver in chunks, but he needs someone around the house to help him. Uh, and if you'd be interested in that, I'm sure he would be willing and I could set it up. So uh, Pat Berger introduced us and, you know, got me free housing with one of the most eminent scholars of my field for that first summer. And the second summer, I was just doing my own research and Jim was back in Berkeley and remembered me and asked if I would come down uh, again. So that's how I got to know him. I spent two summers living with him in Berkeley. Uh, just the summers? Just the summers. He had, he had asked if I would stay through the year, uh, but in the first summer I was still at my pre-generals phase and I didn't think it was wise to leave the environment uh, of Princeton where I had all of the resources available to me. Um, to create that same kind of access at UC Berkeley would have taken a little bit of bureaucratic wrangling and I just, that first summer it wasn't really viable. And then later uh, when he asked, well, your post generals now, you know, why don't you come out here and stay with me and you can live in the house, uh, you know, Berkeley's a wonderful place, I'm here, we can have conversations. And I thought long and hard about that, uh, about whether that would be, um, you know, ideal for my, my work. I instantly wanted to do it. We got along great. I love the Bay Area uh, and I loved conversations with him every day. Uh, there really didn't seem to be an immediate reason why I shouldn't except for the fact that I'd built a kind of infrastructure of support in terms of advisors and students here at Princeton that I felt like ab abandoning that would would have repercussions on my, my research. Uh, and so I decided to be conservative and stay here uh, in Princeton. And you know, I've been here six years now. It's the longest I've been anywhere since I grew up, basically. And you know, it's, it's, it's been good to me. But a part of me does wonder what it would have been like if I had spent the last four years living in the Bay Area with, with Jim. Um, you said conversations. Yeah, lots of conversations. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, a, a day with Jim was, was interesting because it was split up at all sorts of, uh, you know, intervals that were unexpected. My normal day was to get up, uh, be out of the house by around eight, to make it to campus for a nine to 12 class every morning, Monday through. Friday, that first summer. Uh, and then I would come back in the afternoon. One of the things, one of my duties, you know, you know never were they that severe, was to pick up the, the, the Times, the New York Times. He needed a print edition of that. That was pretty much the only regular activity, you know, that, that he asked of me. Uh, but he would be up sometimes when I left at eight in the morning. Sometimes when I come came back in the middle of the day, he'd already be having a nap. He was on about a three or a four hour cycle of being awake uh, and being asleep. You know, we sort of alternate and he'd be up in the middle of the night sometimes and want to have a conversation when I was coming down to get a glass of water or something. Uh, but we talked about everything. I mean, that paper really fueled his, uh, our discussions as well. I mean, it would, it would be everything from current politics uh, to um, where the state of the Chinese painting field was uh, at, you know, at this given moment, whether I had anything to contribute to it, uh, to reminiscences about Berkeley. He loved to talk about 
being there in high school and about uh, being there in college as well and teaching there. Um, you know, and it wasn't too hard to get him to open up and, and to tell these stories. You just had to listen and keep asking questions every now and then, you know, keep putting putting quarters in with, with nice, you know, just asking questions. Um, was there anything about in your own field of study that you actually learned from him in the, in the process? I mean, what hadn't I learned from him is probably a better way to put it. He was part of this generation of scholars that was trained uh, and kind of came of age in the 50s and that defined especially Chinese painting as as it is now. Um, people like Jim Cahill and Wen Fong and uh, Jude Sing Lee and uh, Rick Bar. I mean, uh, uh, Barnhart at Yale, for some reason, the, the first name is escaping me now, I've never met him. Uh, these guys absolutely defined the field, and it wasn't there weren't that many of them. Uh, and so in a, in a certain sense, Jim's scholarship was already with me. Uh, but he was interested in my topic, uh, particularly because my topic was a bit odd. Uh, certainly it fits under the you know, rubric of what of what literati painting is, uh, but it it sort of I've chosen the least appealing of the literati painters to talk about, um, and I position a lot of my argument about why the early nineteenth century, which is what I write about uh, for my dissertation, is interesting off of a quote from one of his books, The Compelling Image, which is one that a lot of people go to. It was one that my advisor, Jerome Silvergeld, made sure that, that all of his students read. Um, you know, it was, it's that much of a keystone book in the field. And he ends the book more or less by saying, you know, after the late 18th century, there's really very little that, that we can talk about as contributing to the field of literati painting. Uh, you know, and it's just, if I can remember correctly, just after mentioning the painter that I work on, he's like, you know, this painter was okay, but it wasn't really uh, part of the story that I'm telling of, of what literati painting is and was. And in reaction to, to that, uh, I'm asking, why is there this space between what we call modern painting and the end of literati painting as wherever you want to define it? Uh, some people would say it's still continuous. Why is this ignored? Why doesn't it fit with any narrative? Because they weren't making paintings for nothing. And so when we talked about it over lunch or breakfast or whenever he was up in chatty, um, you know, he'd push me on that topic. Uh, you know, why the, why the hell did you choose <laughs> these guys? Those probably weren't his words, but you know, tell me again why you're interested in these painters. They're good. I like some of their paintings, but it's, you know, it's not significant. Why don't you pick one of these big name painters? Why don't you go back to Wen Zhengming or Shen Zhou? Or he really had, at that point, a, a whole portfolio on one artist that, uh, you know, quite famous, Bada Shanren. Uh, and he had a portfolio and he felt like it was really time for someone to do a full, you know, monograph uh, a, a, on Bada Shanren to reconsider him. And when a student at Harvard is and, and worked with that portfolio of information that, that Jim had collected over the years. Um, but his, you know, his contribution to my dissertation was really just to sort of ask pointed questions that were not antagonistic. You know, you, you know certain advisors can be you know, very rough in the way that they, they force you to defend your, your ideas, and other advisors can be too soft. What was interesting about having conversations with him is that they sort of managed to be both at the same time. I knew I was being put on the spot and yet it was an encourage, there was an encouraging uh, atmosphere about the conversation. Uh, and that was something he managed to strike well, a kind of critical uh, approach to dialogue that didn't make, at least didn't make me feel as if I were being criticized. A number of people have talked about his his way of seeing mm -hmm. and his communication of his way of seeing. Um, did you did you um, get any insight into that, or, or was that interesting to you? 
Uh, was it something you got from his writing more than his than the conversations? Or could you talk about that? You know, we didn't have the opportunity to look at paintings in person together. We would look at reproductions together sometimes and, and talk about them. And it's hard for me to say whether I picked up anything in particular from those conversations because it felt like we were on the same wavelength in terms of discussing composition, brushwork, uh, how a painting was constructed and, and then what ramifications that had on its position in relation to other paintings and painters. And, you know, there are a variety of people that have trained me to look at paintings before Jim and, and Jim taught some of those people, people like uh, Arnold, Arnold Chang, uh, really taught me how to look at the way in which uh, a painting is constructed brush mark by brush mark and to think about the dynamics of that. Um, and so when Jim and I talked about paintings, it was often in this shared vocabulary, a vocabulary that, that he likely helped to establish. Um, but my mind doesn't rest on that in particular because it felt so natural, I suppose. It wasn't something you were aware of picking up. Right, and, and, and again, I guess I would return to the idea that because that kind of um, way of looking and the, is part and parcel of the establishment of the field of Chinese painting history in the States, that he uh, and his you know, generation, his cohort, um, created and established. Did, did he try to... Um draw you into any of the controversies he had been involved in? Of course. Uh, I mean, in, in these later years that I knew him, he was still very passionate about the riverbank uh, issue. And he more or less said that he didn't want to leave the world without really making sure that his, that his, that his viewpoint was understood. <laughs> that, uh, you know, and it was a real driving passion for him. And one of his... I'm not sure if this person ever was a student. I can't remember the guy's name had written, you know, a book manuscript form about Zhang Daqian and his forgeries that, and, and he came by the house a couple of times. I can't remember the guy's, the guy's name, but it was still very much on his mind. And, and I took a relatively neutral position on that. My concerns in general uh, range much later in time. Um, you know, Ming Qing, uh, modern and contemporary, painting, which of course is a long spread, but we're expected to cover that uh, much more you know, broadly than, than, say, our Western counterparts. Uh, and of course, Song painting uh, uh, is going to be, you know, at, at the basis of anything that we, that we think about, but, uh, yeah, what's that? Got it. We're everywhere. We're everywhere Got it. Tech. <laughs> All right. Duck and cover. Um, is it all safe to come out? Not, not yet. No. Not yet. So it sounds like you're saying it's not a modern painting. What's that? It sounds like you're saying it's not a modern painting. Uh, a modern painting would be within uh, your sphere. Uh, right. This is a good point. You know, if it's a forgery, then it's certainly within my range of. Uh, of, of capability or something I should be thinking about. But, you know, both sides of the argument are useful in terms of discussing how we look at, at painting. And that's very much a position that I inherited from my advisor, Jerome. Uh, and one that I would stick to is that seeing it from both sides is a very useful task. Can, can you, can you um, lay out the terms of how he... He saw, he saw the Riverbank controversy? Or? Jerome or, or well, Jim? All, all of the people you, you would know. <laughs> and then your own. Well, Jim mm -hmm. first. Yeah, Jim first, absolutely. Oh, God, this is a kind of uh, historiography question that I should have come prepped for. Um, I should have reviewed that catalog before I came. Um, so the, the painting was, as I remember it, in C.C. Wong's collection. It was sold to the Met and uh, taken in as a genuine uh, painting by uh, Dong Yuan, who is this crucial painter in the history of, of Chinese painting, especially as it was established 
uh, by people like Dong Chi Chang in the um, in the 16th and 17th century as a as a kind of um, origin point for styles of painting that then would develop out of it. Uh, and if it was indeed by Dong Yuan, it's one of the most important paintings, you know, in, in any collection. You know, it ranks up there with uh, Guo Xi's um, Early Spring or, or any of these other paintings that we use to constitute the kind of the, the canon. Um, and Jim was suspicious of it. Uh, there are things about it that didn't ring true with his idea of what Dong Yuan style was and, and should be. And it was largely through stylistic analysis, uh, things like uh, brushwork format composition, that he arrived at that understanding. And um, looking at the history of the paintings uh, collection, one of his hypotheses was that well, the one that he made that he stuck to, I guess, is that it was a forgery, possibly by Zhang Daqian. You know, it was a it was an early twentieth century forgery. Um, and if that's the case, then we can't use it to constitute part of the canon. Uh, we can use it for many other interesting things to discuss topics about forgery, why such things exist, and why in Chinese painting they're so uh, rampant, and whether there's other vocabulary to describe it other than forgery, it's emulation, uh, uh, imitation, it depends on the intent of the person making the later painting. Uh, and it, if it were a forgery, you know, it's created out of nothing. There is no prime object that's being copied. It's not an exact copy, it's a, an invention. What does that then say about earliest, early 20th century understandings of Dong Yuan style. And what does it say about Zhang Daqian as someone who is understood by Jim uh, and the people who support that position as a painter who's capable of doing such virtuosic work that confuses everybody uh, in, the, in the field, uh, you know, the genuineness of the forgery. Um, and Jim was adamant that this really should not be considered as early a painting as it was being considered. Uh, and he thought it was detrimental to the field that this would become part of the canon. Uh, and he just wanted everyone to understand that. Uh, on, and he kept reiterating it, basically. Um, and, you know, th there were people who had just as solid a position as, as Jim did in d terms of defending from evidence that was stylistic and uh, historical in terms of the transmission of the object. Uh, describing it as as a genuine Dongyuan painting, um, and so there was a there was a symposium held at the Met with this painting, uh, and one of the reasons why I suppose I default to a kind of mediator position is that my advisor was the mediator for the event, um, and he's quite famous, I guess, for for this among among his other work. Uh, he came in wearing a referee's jersey, and people still talk about that. Um, you know, because it was a way of taking the pressure down a notch by saying, "Like we're really here to discuss things, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually be refereeing." It's that, in, uh, it's that intense of a situation. People are, are that, uh, you know, ingrained in their uh, positions that we need someone like a referee to uh, to see out the sport of this event. He might describe it as something you know entirely different, but that's how I understood it. I wasn't present there, un unfortunately, but I was present in 2007, I think it was, when that painting went to uh, an exhibition at the Taipei uh, Palace Museum, and it was put next to Fan Quan's uh, uh, painting and to uh, Guo Xi's painting. Uh, and uh, the Li Tang painting there as well. And, and the question then becomes in comparison, side by side with all of these absolutely you know, unquestioned, really uh, canonical objects, whether the Dong Yuan attribution stands up. Um, and again, it's, it's an unsolvable issue, but the debate makes it worth talking about.
because it reveals our own biases and understandings of the field and and how it is we make our arguments. How did you how did you argue when you talked with Jim about it? I listened, to be honest, because I knew that arguing with him, especially because I'm not a Song Yun specialist, uh, arguing with him about it would have been sort of futile. I didn't have the kind of uh, ammunition to engage on that level. Uh, so when we talked about it, I just asked him how he felt. I mean, that's the best way to engage in any conversation. So, you know, how did this make you feel? What was your understanding? Or how do people react? And just ask these kinds of follow-up questions. And he was just as impassioned about it in his own kitchen on a Friday morning, you know, or Friday afternoon, uh, as I imagine he was at the debate as it occurred at the Met, so. Um, are there any little stories about uh, Jim, things that happened while you were there living together that oh. would help us understand him? That would help you understand him. Um, I mean, there are so many sort of little bits and bobs about the daily living experience. <clears throat> I think one thing might be that when we began to discuss my dissertation topic, which was almost immediately, you know, he sat down in the kitchen the morning after he had come in, he was like, well, let's talk about your work some, you know, as a way of getting to know me. And as I talked to him about the painter I was working on, this early 19th century painter, Chen Du, uh, he's, he you know, got animated and excited. He's like, oh, there's this painting and there's this painting. And he wanted to go and dig up in his library upstairs slides that he had taken from trips to China and, you know, or in Japan in the 80s. And he was so engaged by my, you know, sort of just mentioning of this artist with the memories of his own sort of research uh, in, in general that he just, he just wanted to help. It, 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 he wanted to give me as much information as he possibly could, and that included like just scrounging around, digging through old slides, and, and finding anything that he had available. And that kind of um, enthusiasm for fostering the field I, I just was present in almost any conversation we had. Um, and of course, what was strange about being someone of the up, like sort of the generation of art historians being born now, you could, you could say, and, and him being the kind of the grandfather figure of the field um, was that all of my understanding of who he was as a person was wrapped up in his writing and, and his ideas about um, Chinese painting. But there were these incredible swaths of interest that you know, never made it into print. They made it onto his website, I think, in, in part, that really helped to define him as a person who was not just uh, the prototypical, you know, ivory tower scholar who burrows into one field and has no capacity to understand what anyone else's interests and concerns are. He was really fascinated uh, by contemporary politics, uh, uh, wanted to kind of make sure the world was going in the right direction. He was just an impassioned humanist, I think, at the most fundamental level. He wanted to make sure I knew about all of these fantastic old movies that no one watched anymore. Uh, he was a huge movie buff, and you know, uh, you know, but everything from Buster Keaton all the way up through, um, you know, I can't even name half the. He has, I think he has on his on his blog a list of movies and why he likes them so much. Classical music, opera, theater, all of these things. Uh, when they came up as conversations, were part, you know, impassioned recollection of events. He talked about being in high school and having the director of the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra, I can't remember, uh, invite him, you know, to events and backstage and they were a group of, you know, young young guys who would go to these these concerts, uh, these classical music concerts in Berkeley and I guess it was the, must have been the 40s. Uh, it, was, it was a really broad ranging you know, humanist, uh, at a, the sort of kind, which maybe you don't see as much nowadays. Maybe the way academia has developed 
creates less of an opportunity for these kinds of of uh, of people. But that's amusing, you know. I'm not sure it's sustainable. You, you mentioned a, a story. You asked me about a story of someone who told me a certain story about was it public there? No. What was it? Somebody's story about a fruit called Oh, I can't remember that story. All I know is that when I was there that summer, uh, one of the paintings he wanted to talk about, because I was from Princeton and I had taken a course with Yoshi Shimizu, uh, his last course that he, that he taught at Princeton, and they were old friends. And Yoshi went back to the West Coast, and so they had this kind of shared West Coast interest as well. I had sent him a joke about a painting with these five um, persimmons in it. The Japanese paintings, quite famous, and I'm remiss in the fact that I can't remember who it's by. Uh, and it was, I suppose, the way to, to sort of turn that story or imagine how it actually relates to Jim's life and who he was is that the objects that he was interested in, uh, the ones that he researched and spent his lives his life making. Um, intelligible to a broader audience uh, were important as historical objects, but they were also important as vehicles for social interaction, as, as, as jokes between him and another scholar uh, in the field. And I wish I could remember the kind of the playfulness of it. I can only just give you the atmosphere. It was a, it was a really playful interaction that, uh, you know, Yoshi had sent him this postcard and Jim just wanted to talk about this painting and then about his friendship with Yoshi and about memories they had about, you know, traveling and doing research uh, together. And it was almost as if every painting that he talked about, and he had an incredible encyclopedic memory of, of these paintings and when he saw them and who he saw them with, uh, was a story both about the painting and also about uh, the people uh, who he spent his career interacting with and who were, you know, friends of various sorts. There's a lot of reminiscing. <laughs> Did you get to know uh, any of his family members? Yeah, I mean, uh, Sarah and I uh, spent a lot of time corresponding uh, because she was the one uh, who was most present in Berkeley to attend to you know, his needs. And so when there was a concern I had about how Jim was doing, uh, you know, because in those later years, his body was, was not as stable as... as as any of us would have liked, I'm sure, him being first and foremost on that list. Uh, and so she was really present throughout all of that time to make sure that Jim was well cared for, to make sure I wasn't some kind of, you know, flub, you know, there to take advantage of the situation rather than to actually be uh, present, you know, with her father. And she also realized that being present in the house all the time, they needed somebody in the house. Uh, and she tried her best to convince me to, to stay as, as, as well. And if I hadn't been, you know, as selfish, I guess, as, a, as I was, as concerned with my own work, maybe, maybe I would have. Um, but she was the one I got to know the best. Um, and then there were a couple of moments, uh, maybe it's just one, one moment I remember when uh, his sons came down from Vancouver for his birthday party. And this was something that, uh, I, I, as I understand it, they did every year. They rented this big house in Inverness, uh, which was maybe an hour and a half away. Uh, and it was a house that they had always rented, one of these big old, uh, you know, circa 1900 houses that had an interesting backstory behind it as well. It was some sort of um, pre-earthquake, San Francisco earthquake, rich businessman who had done a lot of work with China and trade, uh, lost everything because he was in real estate, and so everything collapsed in the in the earthquake, and he sort of went broke. But this house was was his, and it, you know, was part of, in some ways, Jim's understanding of the Bay Area as this dynamic uh, place of interaction with Asia, I guess, and and its in its past. Um, that's getting a little bit side topic, but they would they rented this house for a week, and Jim went up there to have his birthday party. Um, and his sons came down for it. Um, a lot of his old students were there. It was Julia White, um, Rick Vinograd, Pat Berger, um, and various other friends from the community. You know, it wasn't just a one dimensional, you know, who's related to him and who does Chinese art history. There were some other friends that came up too and we grilled 
oysters on the back deck, which was something that Rick Vinograd, I guess, had a, a skill for. He was the oyster master. I'd never heard of grilling them before. Uh, you know, when you grow up in Vermont, you don't grill oysters. <laughs> um, you know, and that, that sort of celebratory nature of that moment of his 85th birthday, I think it was, it just really brought home to me the way in which I was lucky enough to be on the tail end of this interlocking chain of scholars and friends connected through Chinese art history. And I really feel that way about the field in general. It's, it's small and certainly there, it has its uh, contentious topics, but I've found so many very, very willing mentors in this field. and I. It surprises me when I think about my friends who are on modernist tracks or, uh, you know, in other areas of art history. There's not this sense that they really know the field and, and are, are friends with people kind of generations uh, above, above them. And I think that's something really special. And you might trace it back to the kind of birth of the field of Chinese painting history, particularly as what I would be connected to. In, in that period when, you know, Jim and Wen Fong and all these people created, created it, I guess. Maybe I'm being a bit romantic with that, but. Did you ever meet uh, the boy's, uh, the, his second wife, the boy's mother, or did she? Yeah, uh, I did. She came down that same week and the boys came down to take some things from the house that were hers and I helped facilitate that, I kind of, um, you know, just made sure she had what she needed, uh, made her some lunch because I was making lunch anyway, and so helped facilitate her moving things out of the house uh, one day when I was there. That was the one time I met her and had a conversation with her. Well, she's also in the field, in your mm -hmm. field, so you never had any discussions with her about that? No, she, I mean, her topic's a lot earlier than mine, and, you know, the, the reasons that she was down there were not field-related, they were personal, and so we didn't really get into a conversation about uh, the field in that sense. It, was she, what was her relationship with Jim like at the time, or did they not even meet? Uh, they were not yet divorced. They were going through a divorce, um, and, you know, I would have, well, I mean, you know, I didn't ask too much about the dynamics of that. You know, what Jim wanted to share with me, I let him share. One of the things that I do remember about that that struck me was that he had absolutely no, you know, there was no acrimony. There's no, there's no sort of uh, anger there. He was happy with the time he had had in this relationship, and he and he spoke very sort of lovingly, especially about the early years. Uh, and, you know, his attitude toward it when, when he talked about it was that, you know, things happen as they happen. He had no ill will. Uh, and I thought that was, you know, not all divorces occur that way. And I thought that was a particularly um, sort of warm way to handle things. But, I, you know, I, I didn't know the details. It wasn't, wasn't my place. I was there as a facilitator for his life as he was coming back into Berkeley. Uh, you kept you kept talking. You referred to a group of people who were the founders of this field. Of, of right. The field. Uh, um, how would you how would you describe Jim Cahill um, distinctly among those people to separate him out from what those other people did? What what is mm -hmm. his Contribution. Hmm. How to best put this? Uh, you know, there's so much work that all of these scholars did to make a generalization seems unfair to each of them in its own way. He's someone. I mean, all of all of those early guys did. They they worked both in academia and in really important museum collections. And they had this understanding of art history that really came through the object. And that's something that splits the field in a way nowadays. There are a lot of people who come into art history much more from the social history side of things. Uh, and he managed to do 
both, to be a kind of strict formalist in a way, but also to weave in narratives of, of social history, especially uh, in his later career, uh, when the impact of social history on art history, you know, moving away from a kind of uh, strict formalism, uh, when that occurred, he was really at the, at the vanguard of beginning to try and re-describe Chinese painting history and Chinese art history in general uh, th th through social history, uh, and, you know, and being at Berkeley helped, I think, too. Um, you know, his contemporaries and his and his coworkers in that department, people like Svetlana Alpers, um, his discussions with those people helped him, I think, to think about his own his own field in, in new ways. You know, Berkeley is a really dynamic dynamic place um, and you know some of his contemporaries di didn't adapt in that in that direction um, so I if, if there's one thing I think it's the kind of adaptability of his interest he kept trying to keep his ideas dynamic and present with larger trends of, of historical research did you ever meet Svetlana Alpers? <laughs> uh, I only met her really briefly once and not at, at Berkeley. Uh, it was at a conference she was at just this last fall at the IFA and afterward I came and introduced myself to her and, and I the only reason I did that, I don't really like doing that I guess, she because she was among friends and it was a kind of celebratory conference uh, and you know I just said to her, I know that my friend Jim Cahill would want me to say hi to you and that's you know, that's why I'm coming up to, to say hi, just to sort of pass on a greeting from him, and, and by doing that, I'd, I'd wanted to get across the idea that you know he wasn't doing so well, uh, but uh, you know we didn't end up having a conversation because so many people were vying for her attention. She just nodded and thanked me. And do you know how to find her? No. I suppose in a roundabout way, I could give you a connection to somebody who organized that conference, who then would have her contact information if that's what you'd be interested in. But it, I don't, you know, don't have her on speed dial. I think she moved out of I think she moved away from Berkeley I think she's in New York now possibly mm -hmm. I don't know um, let's see uh, are there any stories that you, you thought about before that I didn't ask you about hmm you know all the stories are just sort of about daily about daily life I got to the, the sort of Yeah, just inviting me to see old movies with, with him, uh, and inviting me out to lunch to his old haunts in Berkeley. Yeah. There was um, this one Japanese restaurant he was absolutely sort of enamored with, uh, Noriko no something. It was right on, right on the main drag. Um, it was one of his favorite favorite places and he had known all of the sort of wait staff that had ever worked there as well and he you know part of the joy of being there with him at this at this moment was that he was rediscovering Berkeley he had been away for a while he'd been in Vancouver um, and he was moving back into a place that was sort of central to everything he was he had grown up there he had taught there his whole career and you know his support squad was there you know, his old students, his family. Uh, and although I think he wasn't moving back under his favorite circumstances, he was really happy to be coming back to a place that he loved and had so many memories invested in. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't have any specific stories. Uh, it's, it's just little daily things like crawling up into his attic space and, uh, retrieving this whole box of um, issues of this Chinese magazine that had printed his private collection. Uh, a couple of the paintings of which uh, a friend of mine at the program at Princeton was working on. And so he had me take pictures of them because they were donated to the Berkeley Art Museum. Uh, so I went in and met with Julia White to look at those. And it was fascinating to think of these things that Jim had acquired years ago and to hear him tell me stories about how he had acquired them and what he loved about them. Um, 
what else was with Jim? Oh, he, oh, he tried to he tried to teach me how to cook an artichoke once. It was a disaster, and he told me so. I, I screwed it up. I went online to try and figure out how to cook an artichoke because this was something that he really wanted to have. Uh, you know, the, the spiny, spindly thing that I never grew up with as well, you know, and I see them in these pickled forms, right? And I tried it twice and I burned the hell out of one and I, you know, absolutely destroyed another. And he was nice enough to say, well, the parts of it are, are edible, but um, yeah, we would, we would cook a lot too. Uh, or I would cook for him often. Uh, uh, in on, his uh, reminiscence, did he ever talk about his uh, days in Fort Bragg and his sort of origins, my, uh, we were kind of shocked to find out he was an orphan. I he never talked, yeah, he, I actually never knew that until recently as well. He never talked to me about his childhood, his own kind of, as far back as his reminiscences went, uh, were high school. And he talked about one of his best friends in high school and he liked to get these, like to create these, um, what were they? They were sort of like musical dramas. I don't know if it was quite a play or if it was quite a, a musical, but uh, they would craft these sort of limerick rhymes that would go into these plays, and he would put these plays on for his students later as well, and, and this was another uh, passion of his, but that was about as far back as it went was high school, of going to uh, the San Francisco Symphony, uh, making these plays. And then of spending time in the war, it was, you know, that was where he got his language training. And that was in a way where um, he began, to, I guess, to think of himself as a, a sinologist, although his, his direct connection was actually through Japanese at that point, uh, because he couldn't get to China. Um, and then that was really, a lot of those early scholars, if, the, if they weren't born speaking Chinese, uh, ended up coming to Chinese art through Japanese uh, scholarship. Um, so, and I mean, one of, one of his other students, I've already mentioned uh, Arnold, but uh, Howard and Marianne Rogers have been mentors to me as well. And it's just that interconnectedness of, of the field is something that I really, I find so sort of startling and also heartwarming at the same time. And, you know, many of those people were, were people trained by, by Jim. And Jim used to tell me this one story about when he came to Princeton with his graduate students uh, to visit, uh, one of the stark differences between Wen Fong's students and his students was that the majority of his students were, were women and the majority of Wen Fong's students uh, were men. And I guess one of the jokes that they had was that there was going to be some sort of cross, you know, uh, I don't want, I choose my words carefully here, <laughs> that each would match up with the other. Uh, and one of uh, Wen Fong's nicknames I, for Jim's students was Cahill's Red Guard. Uh, and I think, you know, that puts in contrast to some degree the East Coast versus West Coast divide that, th that those two sort of strains of scholarship, uh, those two mentors to the field really represented. Um, that was a lot of rambling, but... That's some... good, I like that stuff. Yeah. Did he ever uh, talk about his uh, um, first trip to China, when China was first opened up? He did, and he had some pictures, and I, and I really don't remember his specific insights about that. I know that he was really excited about this um, video series, because part of... The video series, uh, I think the first, isn't the first episode about him reminiscing about the field and he brings out all of his old photographs and tells you which important people he saw what with at what time and you know about the like, feasts that they had and uh, so I don't remember his stories about his first trip to China per se but um, you know he told me some hilarious stories which I don't think probably are, are right to repeat about some early collectors and and um, and uh, sort of uh, curators in the field and about their trips to, to Asia together, but I think I'll just keep those on the down low. <laughs> okay.
Yeah, okay, I have, I have one more question. Sure. Just how good a painter is Arnold Chang? <laughs> Uh, wow, um, you're really putting me in the hot seat. Arnold Chang's a great painter. Um, you've looked at his artworks, I, I assume, as he walked you through how his, how his art is, is made. I mean, I, I learned to look at Chinese painting through Arnold's guidance. I mean, I've picked up the brush with a variety of, of people. The first time I ever learned how to uh, manipulate a brush was from a, a Japanese um, woman who lived right around where I grew up in, in Dartmouth, in the Dartmouth sort of uh, satellite region. And she unfortunately passed away about a month before Jim. I've lost a few mentors in the field this, just this spring. It was her, it was Jim and my, my grandfather, just people who really helped kind of shape me. But, you know, she taught me how to do calligraphy. I went to um, China for a year abroad as, a, as an undergraduate while I was at Middlebury and um, spent a whole second semester withdrawing from Middlebury and enrolling in an art academy, learning how to paint there as well. But I don't think any of those, those things might have prepared me in terms of understanding the dynamics of brush, ink saturation, and paper, but I don't think I really understood how literati painting is made until I watched Arnold construct an image, uh, and until I spent time working with him um, studying how painting was done. When I worked at the gallery at Kaikido, which is a job that Arnold, um, you know, clued me into, uh, recommended me for, um, and that that's where I got to know Howard and Marianne. I would go on Sundays out to his place in Queens and with his painting group, um, you know, and the kind of lineage that his painting represents is, you know, un paralleled in a lot of ways. It doesn't exist in China. The kind of training that C.C. Wong had as it connects to the Orthodox group of painters in the Qing Dynasty, I mean, that's direct inheritance right there. And that was more or less severed uh, in mainland China. So it's learning how to look at painting and how to paint in a clumsy way on my part from Arnold has been a formative part of how I think about painting. That was another um, really incredible experience. So right after undergrad, I went to work at Kaikido uh, for sort of, in total, about almost a, a year's time. It was broken up because I had an obligation back in Vermont to coach a, a ski team for the winter, which they kindly let me do. And I was the gallery assistant, live-in assistant at, uh, at Kaikido, thanks to Arnold's recommendation. I got a year-long scholarship from the Rotary Club to be an ambassadorial scholar in Sweden, which is sort of, it was an excuse to trace my own ancestry, which is something I always wanted to do. And I wanted to see if I could distract myself from Chinese art, which I had spent so much of my undergrad career in one way or another building toward, to see if it was something I really wanted to stick to. And I came back after that year thinking, absolutely, I still want to do this. But in the meantime, Kaikido had downsized to a duplex from this beautiful five-story building at uh, you know, 64th and Lex. Um, and they didn't have space for a gallery assistant anymore. And so I was biding my time, taking the GREs, thinking I'll go to grad school at some point, but not quite yet. I don't really have the experience yet. And you know, Arnold again stepped in and said, well, why don't you, why don't you go to China? I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. My Chinese needs a jog, but, but to do what? And he said, well, you know, there's an auction house there. It's a Chinese auction house um, run by, by Chinese nationals. It's not Sotheby's or Christie's. Uh, and it's the most reputable auction house in China at the moment. Uh, and why don't you go work for them? You know, you may not make much in comparison to some of your friends and contemporaries, but you know, no one else is doing that. And so I spent almost three years working at uh, China Guardian Auctions, um, Zhongguo Jiado, uh, Pai Mai Hang in Beijing as their sort of liaison for non-Chinese speaking um, yeah, clients, whether they were clients that were com you know, buying things or clients that were uh, commissioning things for sale, and I helped uh, particularly in the, I 
forced my way into the painting department. They wanted me in media for a while to like do PR stuff. And I just said, after about a half a year of that, I'm, I'm here to learn about paintings. And so I was just surrounded by the onslaught of the volume of you know, Chinese paintings that were coming onto the market and the growth of the auction industry at that point. It was an incredible place to be a fly on the wall uh, from 2006, seven and eight. Um, and just to see how dynamic the auction industry was at that point, how it was changing so quickly, how rules and regulations were popping up left and right and taxation. And just to see the kind of amazing objects coming up for sale uh, at, that, at that point. If, if anything, that's, I mean, all of these experiences that I had sort of got me into the field, but, but that's what pushed me both towards deciding I wanted to be more academic about it, but also gave me the kind of volume of looking at Chinese painting that you, you can't really get in any other way these days. It trained my eye in a way uh, that, um, you know, is, is, is next to Im impossible to achieve in any other way than just looking at a huge volume of artworks. And so that was a, that was a really special experience. So that hel helps you with authentication, all of these things, learning about that kind of experience. Absolutely. I mean, I've seen so many things that were obviously fake, so many things that were a lesser number of things that were real masterpieces, and then all, everything in between. And it's the in between and the debates that you overhear from uh, the scholars that the auction house would bring in to authenticate works, from the people who are the heads of the department. Just hearing the debates about, okay, well, how much is this right? You know, what parts about this painting are right? How much can we get behind it? Where do we set the price at in terms of our understanding of the value of this artist in the field in, in general, you know, how much people will pay for it, but also in terms of how, how much we believe in this, this painting. Uh, you know, it was, it, just overhearing all of those conversations and every once in a while, kind of like throwing five cents in uh, to the mix was, was a training in its own, in its own right. Um, how do you explain the, the large amount? Of, you said there were uh, there was a large amount of material coming on the market. How do you explain that at that time? This is one of the things that I, I think I took away that most fascinated me about uh, the growth of the market uh, at, at that point in China. It's that while a lot of attention in 2006, 7, and 8 from Western news sources was being focused on the rise of contemporary art in, in China. That market was dwarfed by the interest in classical art that existed within mainland China and the volume of artworks being put on the market and take, and then bought off the market within mainland China at that point. It was just staggering how much was being exchanged in comparison to contemporary um, artists uh, making work, uh, it just, and, and when I was thinking about it, I was like, well, why isn't this making a greater story uh, in media, you know, abroad, international news sources? And it, and it, and it struck me that it was something, there was something about its Chineseness that was, that was important. And all of this is to say that the nouveau riche, the people coming up with all of this uh, wealth and not knowing what to do with it, the real estate market had kind of plateaued and was looking to kind of be about to burst in terms of uh, the bubble effect that happened there. People didn't know where to invest their money uh, because of, there isn't really a kind of um, viable stock market as well. Um, and contemporary art is, you know, by nature, much more volatile. And classical art was one place to focus. But the interest in classical art in particular by these nouveau riche really meant for me as I was seeing people coming to coming to auctions and and you know and investing in it. Uh, what it meant for me was a a rise in the interest of the kind of long durée history of of China and how to insert yourself as a kind of um, you know, a player in the field in connection to, to China's extended past. I'm not expressing this very well, but what I mean to say is that. There is a, there's an incredible interest on behalf of influential, you know, 
people in, in China now it, in connecting with the greater past of China, including Imperial China. And that's something that is done through, and traditionally always has been done through uh, artwork. Um, establishing a collection that demonstrates to your peers that you understand the development of Chinese civilization uh, and culture through art objects uh, is is a you know, time honored tradition. You look at Song Huizong or you know the Qianlong Emperor or the Kangxi Emperor, creating a collection like that wasn't just about a love for the objects. It was about the kind of political and social use of of those objects. And I think that's that's partly what's happening now. Not only is it a way to invest your money in something that that has a kind of um, you know, a tested history of value, but it's it's a way of reconnecting with the past that was in all likelihood denied to most of the people who are now coming up in their 50s uh, as really influential players in China. I mean, they grew up in a time when that, the encouragement of a connection to that past was really, you know, neutered. Would, would you say that this is uh, some kind of attempt to to establish the communist dynasty as a legitimate Chinese dynasty in the long tradition, uh, as opposed to the early Maoist attempts to just sever everything, and, or the propaganda side of that, even though they weren't really completely doing that. Right, they weren't completely doing that. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which um, China under the Mao years was st still maintaining a very specific and... Uh, um, a choice connection to to the past and it's evident in things like Mao's calligraphy which you know adorns like a third of the public buildings in China now you know or, or at least you know around the time he died it was, it was just everywhere and the power of calligraphy to transmit uh, the idea but also the body of the person making it uh, is is rooted in the history of calligraphy and the history of rulership uh, and there's some very good books uh, about this, um, certainly not, not my idea. Um, but as the way you're phrasing it, I, I, is is probably not how I would would put it, because you know you're talking about an institution uh, and calling it a, a communist uh, dynasty, and, and at the institutional level, this kind of collecting doesn't place anymore. Museums like uh, the Palace Museum in Beijing uh, the, uh, or someplace like the Tianjin Fine Arts Museum, you know, their budget's not for acquisition. The things that they have are the things that they have and it's about finding new ways to display them and there's this incredible boom in museum construction that's happening now in China as well and creating these kinds of arts districts in all the major urban centers uh, and sometimes a lot of thought is put into them and sometimes less thought is put into them. but um, the use of objects, cultural objects, to establish a very specific narrative of history for the various bodies doing so in China today is, is, is yes, it's, it's definitely happening. Um, but how those narratives, you know, are particularly inflected by communist, socialist, capitalist um, sort of imperatives is, I think, something that is a very important topic, but we, have, we don't have the perspective on it now to, to be able to say exactly what's happening. It's just that people with money are taking an interest not just in what's happening within the 40 years that they've lived. They're taking an interest in connecting themselves to the past in a way that's that's encouraging because it wasn't allowed at least in a privatized sense uh, for a long period of, of time and the various misunderstandings and um, reappropriations of ideas that are occurring in that process will be a really fascinating thing to study in probably 30 years or so um, the rise of a reinvestment in what it means to be Chinese not just in a nationalist sense or a socialist sense or a capitalist sense, but in you know, 
the largest sort of uh, spectrum of, the, of that identity that you could possibly draw. I don't know, it sounds like we almost have a lecture here. <laughs> <laughs> In art history, you know. Yeah. We, 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 we let's hope most, let's hope so most of it's you, right. You, you, well, did you listen to everything? Yeah, pretty much. That's good. Anything else? I'm glad we asked him about China because that's a very important That was a very, yeah, yeah I, I, nobody I, else, would, I wouldn't have known. <laughs> nobody else has done that. Anything else you think we might ask? No, he, he covered think, everything. Yeah, we really In fact, have. Forget about everybody else. Just <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's just the whole, you wasted all your time talking to Howard. <laughs> like that. All right, um, turn off, and then we. Um,